inspirational personalities have achieved more than most. But we forget they are normal people, just like us. So we want to learn about the way they think, to understand how we have achieved greatness. Martin Rees, welcome. You were the master of Trinity College, uh, founder of the Center for Existential Risk, author of a number of books. Which of these many accomplishments are you most proud of? It's hard to say because I think I did my science in the earlier part of my career. I then had the opportunity to uh, diversify a bit into uh, new areas covering sciences outside my own and war questions of policy, etc. And I was very lucky to have that opportunity uh, so that even if I felt my science was getting to a plateau, I had some new things to do. And is there a particular moment uh, from your career that is the fondest memory, an instant, uh, a publication or, or the moment you got in some news? I don't think there is because uh, my science has involved following a fairly broad field of astronomy and astrophysics, um, following the observations made on the ground and in space by lots of groups and trying to make sense of what they find. And this involves a lot of collaboration, uh, trying to do calculations, uh, computer calculations using physics to try and explain what's going on. And uh, I've really been lucky in that all through my career, which started in the uh, mid to late 1960s, there's been a succession of exciting new discoveries. Right back when I started, we didn't know if the universe had a beginning in a big bang or not. We didn't know about black holes or any of these things. And there's been a whole consecutive set of new discoveries made possible mainly by better equipment on the ground and in space. Um, I'm an armchair theorist and uh, that doesn't get you very far by itself because we're not as wise as Aristotle. We won't get any further except we've now got lots of data from experiments. So I try to make sense of what's discovered by uh, people using all kinds of techniques on the ground and in space. You've been at Cambridge for, for most of your life, but you've been around um, other famous names that even we as biologists know, Roger Penrose, mm -hmm. um, Stephen Hawking, yeah. um, and you were a student of Dennis, Dennis Schaumann. Dennis Schaumann yes. um, w was it odd seeing some of your colleagues sort of propel into sort of celebrities in a way, um, where, where they, they sort of permeated the, the collective consciousness that, of pop culture in a way, where we're, everybody came to know Stephen Hawking, for example. Well, well, Roger Penrose is really the father of modern relativity. I mean, uh, uh, relativity, of course, dates back to Einstein, 1915, but it was a rather sterile subject in the following 30 years um, because um, uh, there were no um, phenomena that were uh, observed where it was more than a tiny correction to Newton. So there wasn't a great motivation. And so what happened in the 1960s was first the discovery of objects like black holes, uh, where relativity was, it was crucial. But also Roger Penrose, who was a mathematician by origin, um, he injected new ideas into the subject and led to an impetus in the research in the theory of general relativity. And um, he was at this time at London University and um, uh, I was lucky in that Dennis Sharma, who you mentioned, who was my PhD advisor, was a very charismatic person who followed the field broadly. And he encouraged um, all of us um, to take very seriously what Penrose was doing. And many people went to his lectures in London, etc. And among them was Stephen Hawking, uh, who was um, two years ahead of me. Um, and uh, his disease had already just started. Um, and uh, he and various other people at that time um, got their impetus from ideas of Roger Penrose. Mm -hmm. And of course, Stephen Hawking became an extraordinary phenomenon because uh, it wasn't thought he'd live to finish his PhD at that stage, mm -hmm. let alone to sort of have a celebrity that went on for more than 50 years after that. So right. he was an extraordinary phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And almost uh, one of the first of his kind in that way, like Asha was saying, to enter in into celebrity. Yes, well, it was extraordinary because, I mean, uh, he, he was certainly one of the, the top people in the subject, there's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, uh, he had a long career. Uh, he had lots of collaborators. Um, but I think it was the um, concept of the um, imprisoned mind roaming the universe 
uh, which made him a cult figure, um, really. I mean, I think had he been um, one of the world's leading geneticists in a wheelchair, I don't think it would have had the same resonance with people. Uh, I think it was because, uh, um, you know, he had on the cover of his first book a picture of him in his wheelchair and the stars in the background, etc. So it was that contrast which I think made him uh, a uh, uniquely um, charismatic figure and 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 um, boosted him into worldwide fame. And do you have a memorable moment from that time? Well, I have lots of memories because, of course, I, I, I've, uh, although, um, as you say, I've worked in other places, I was at Sussex University and I had very short spells in the United States. I've been based in Cambridge and so I've, I've followed him and knew him all through his life um, uh, from when he was finishing his PhD when I started. Um, and uh, um, I suppose uh, many memories, but, but one in particular was <clears throat> in 1974, which was... Um, just before he did what proved to be his most exciting result, called Black Hole of Apparition. Um, I remember um, he worked in the same institute as I did, and uh, I used to sort of push him in his wheelchair um, along to his office, and he could barely turn the page of a book, so I'd open a book on cosmological dynamics, which is something he was just studying for the first time. And I remember thinking then that uh, he's done great stuff, but probably that's the last we'll see from him because he's so frail. But this uh, subsequent piece of work was, in fact, in retrospect, his most important. And so we hadn't seen the last of him then. And that was um, more than 45 years ago now. And, and was, it, was it friendly? Was it competitive, the environment between? It seems like such a, an auspicious time in some ways, I guess, looking back now. Yes. Well, no, I, I would say it was very friendly. We were, um, the, the group was very close-knit, and, uh, um, and uh, um, there was Fred Hoyle and... Uh, um, Sharma, etc. But I think more than that, um, I think at that time in the 60s, um, there were three really important groups um, doing the pioneering stuff in relativity. Um, and one was the, uh, uh, the group um, around Penrose and Sharma in the UK, and that, uh, that's the one I was in. Um, there was a group in uh, the United States, and the, um, uh, the great a guru figure there was John Wheeler, who was a very impressive man who was based at Princeton. He had a whole succession of students. And a third group was in Moscow, where the uh, group uh, under the great physicist Zeldovich, um, they did in parallel lots of the same work. And, uh, of course, there were problems with getting communication uh, with uh, uh, the Russian group, you know, because they weren't allowed to travel, and they had a big... Uh, uh, fuss in order to get papers published in English and all that. But nonetheless, I would say relations were very um, friendly. And I remember particularly uh, the first important conference I went to that made a big impact was in 1967 when there was a big international astronomy meeting held in Prague. This was just before the Prague Spring, but all the Russians were able to come to that. And that was the first time that we in the West had the chance to meet them. So that's a long answer to say that there were these three groups, but all very cooperative. And I have to say that it's um, uh, a big contrast to certain other fields of science where there seems to be a rather nasty kind of cooperation. And I was rather shocked by the book by, Ven by Venki Ramakrishnan, um, who uh, is a very friendly man, but about how he actually hated his collaborators. And so it's really, uh, uh, there was nothing like that in our field. Surprising, given the number of developments in your field at that time. Well, well there were one or two, one or two sort of uh, uh, vendettas. There was a famous one between Fred Hoyle and Martin Ryle, the radio astronomer, um, and uh, um, disagreeing about whether there was a Big Bang or not, uh, etc. But uh, I would say that um, the, the um, collaboration among the theorists was rather good, and of course, the thing that's happened in our subject, and. Uh, in many other subjects too, of course, is that uh, the need to have large facilities has led to the need to have more uh, collaboration. So uh, most people involved in uh, gathering data, whether by experiments or by observations, if they're astronomers, has to work in a large team. And of course, uh, um, therefore, uh, one has to um, get on with one's collaborators reasonably well. Uh, so uh, uh, even though the there were some vendettas in the past. I think there are fewer now. Um, one sees them actually in topics where there 
isn't very much evidence. I mean, I think apart from the ones we used to have in astronomy, um, I think in um, evolutionary biology, I mean, Stephen Jay Gould and Dawkins and uh, Conway Morris and people like that uh, had, their, had their disputes because there wasn't a great deal of data at that time. But of course, the, just to, to go into that, um, the other point is some people enjoy these debates. And if I think back to uh, um, Fred Hoyle and Martin Ryle, who were two senior figures when I was a student, and I admired them both, um, uh, Hoyle had a new idea every day and all that. And so if one idea fell by the wayside, he'd have another one, you know. So he, didn't, uh, he, he was uh, relaxed about this. Whereas Martin Ryle um, had got some data uh, which uh, he was only able to get because he spent five years building a big radio telescope himself, etc. And of course, to be motivated to do that, you've got to feel that the data is important mm -hmm. and going to be right. So uh, uh, the emotional investment which someone has if they spent years on one project is bound to be deeper than that of a theorist who hasn't got the same past stake invested in it yeah. and can have a, another theory very quickly. But what do you think are the, the important qualities that, that have made you successful in astrophysics? Or, or rather, the important qualities required to be successful in astrophysics? Many people would just assume it's pure intelligence, or, or in, in other words, IQ, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, to emotional <laughs> intelligence. Mm -hmm. do, do you think there's some balance there to be, to be struck? Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly not IQ, because from student days, I wasn't the brightest kid at all um, and uh, um, uh, in terms of very technical things um, I've never been specially adept I think I, I've had a sort of um, uh, knack of uh, coming up with sort of simple ideas and simple models um, some of which have proved to be fruitful etc but I think um, the main reason I've been lucky is actually to have been fortunate to spend my career in a uh, an institution um, where there are lots of, uh, of, of bright and stimulating colleagues. So um, one learns a lot through debate and uh, um, many of my papers are collaborative. I mean, that's um, uh, not simply because the other guy does most of the work, but because um, uh, uh, one tosses ideas off, off people and, um, and develops them that way. So I think to be in, in a place um, like Cambridge, where we've had a... a uh, a, a big tradition in astronomy. We have a, a very nice institute where everyone gathers together for coffee and discusses ideas, etc. I've been very lucky, and uh, also at the same time uh, to be able to um, have worldwide contacts. I mean, travelling a great deal until the lockdown um, in 18 months ago. I was travelling all over the world quite a lot, um, and uh, I, I think I, I've enjoyed the variety, uh, which and the stimulus which this, this provides. And as I say, it's a subject where I think there's uh, less of the unpleasant kind of collaboration than there is in some uh, ultra-competitive subjects. If you had to pick one, though, what is your superpower? I'm not sure. I think I'm perhaps good at sort of seeing the connections between, between things and um, uh, uh, perhaps having a slightly broader perspective, which uh, in some sense... Uh, has to be allied with superficiality, but sometimes one can see analogies which uh, those whose work has had a narrow focus would not see. So I, I think compared to most people in astrophysics, um, I've probably worked on a wider range of topics over my career um, in that, you know, when there are specialised workshops um, uh, in different subfields, um, I find myself going to several different ones um, uh, to a greater extent than other other people were. So I think probably um, having a slightly broader perspective has been helpful, as well as being a, a, a stimulus to, to my enjoyment of the subject. And I guess the switching, switching a bit, do you think after, uh, after so many years in physics mm -hmm. and, and having all of the positions you've had, do you think if you were starting again today, do you think you would be as successful to be honest, I'm not sure, because I think um, uh, um, s science, the way it's organized in our universities, um, does involve um, more collaboration, which can be a good thing, it may not be, um, but uh, more sort of a formality in the administration and all that. Um, so uh, I think the uh, 
audit culture, as it were, which is ever more pervasive in our universities, um, makes it um, slightly less attractive as a profession. Um, and there's another sort of demographic thing, which is that um, uh, the, the number of people in the research community and in academia um, grew a lot from the 1960s onwards, expansion of universities and etc. Um, and so um, the young outnumbered the old. And uh, that therefore meant that promotion was quite quick, whereas now uh, the population is fairly stable and um, uh, some people aren't even retiring, they're just going on and on. And this um, means that the um, promotion prospects and the prospects of uh, independence for a young scientists um, seem to be receding into the future. And I think something should be done about this. I see this country is rather better than most in that we have uh, fellowships supported by the Royal Society called University Research Fellowships for young people in their early 30s and all that to make them independent. But unless we do that, I think there's a big risk that um, people who um, uh, want to feel they've made a distinctive contribution in their 30s um, will feel that the opportunities in ac academia are limited. Um, now, of course, um, uh, we, we don't want everyone to be an academic. We want some people to go and uh, start businesses and all, and all that. Um, but um, uh, academia can't survive just on the sort of nerdish element, just people like me. It's got to have people who are flexible in their talents um, and uh, uh, want to achieve something, but would be happy to do something quite different from academia. And I think the risk is that uh, um, uh, academia is becoming uh, um, a career which may be perceived as less attractive to, to those pe people of flexible talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that happens, that would be very bad. And uh, I think it's worse in America where the average age when people get their grants from the National Institute of, he of Health was, uh, was about 42 or 43. And, and uh, that's not the way it was 40 years ago. And so, so I think, um, well, I think they are realizing they've got to do something about this, but um, it's very important that people should uh, feel they can do something independently from an early age. So let's once again change track a little bit. Um, we listened to an interview of you uh, on Radio 4, The Life Scientific, I think it was in 2012. Uh, and you said that you would take a one way ticket to Mars. Uh, when I was older, probably. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, you yes, sort of yes. said, oh, I wouldn't, I'm yes. not sure I'd do it if I was 20 years old. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. If you were 20 years old today, though, might you consider taking a one-way ticket? No, I mean, I, I think I, I still only want to go when I was very old. And, uh, um, and Elon Musk has said that he hopes to die on Mars, but not on impact. And uh, uh, he's now 50. And uh, uh, I can imagine when he's 90, he might be prepared to make, make the trip. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but I think as regards um, human spaceflight, I just finished a book um, called um, uh, um, The End of Astronauts. And this makes the point that the practical need for sending people into space is getting weaker all the time as robotics gets more advanced. Because obviously it's far simpler and cheaper to send a robot that doesn't need maintenance on the journey, as it were, than to send human beings. Um, and so uh, my line is that um, uh, uh, if I was uh, the taxpayer in America or a taxpayer in Europe, I wouldn't pay for a human spaceflight program, uh, but it should be left to these private companies like uh, SpaceX, which is Musk's company, or um, Blue Origin, which is uh, Bezos' company. Um, it should be left to them because, um, first of all, that's not taxpayers' money, that's their, their money or money from sponsors. And, and secondly, they can afford to take higher risks because the trouble with, uh, um, with, with NASA and the European Space Agency is that uh, they're, they're very risk averse if they're sending into space um, uh, civilians who they're paying for, then they've got to keep the risk very low, as we see from the fact that the uh, space shuttle which went up in the 70s and 80s and 90s, um, it crashed twice in 135 launches, and each of those was a big trauma in America, you know. Uh, whereas a 2% failure rate 
um, is something accessible to test pilots and adventurers. So my, my line is that um, human spaceflight should be left to um, uh, SpaceX and equivalent companies, um, and they can have cut price, high risk ventures, um, and uh, be willing people to go even with one way tickets. And I think we should cheer them on. And uh, um, they, they won't find, find Mars very comfortable, but they will go there. And indeed, I think it's a dangerous delusion to think that uh, Mars is a way to escape the Earth's problems, because uh, um, dealing with climate change is a real doddle compared to terraforming Mars. Uh, so, so I think it's, uh, uh, it's, the people on Mars will find it's worse than living at the South Pole or in the ocean bed, uh, etc. But on, on the other hand, if a few pioneers want to go there, just like some do want to go to the Antarctic, um, then I think we should cheer them on. And the reason for that is that by the end of a century, due to advances in uh, genetics and in um, uh, cyborg mind, mind machine interfaces, um, it may be possible for humans to redesign themselves to adapt to an alien environment. Now, here on Earth, we don't have the motive because we have evolved to, to live here on the Earth. And of course, the whole kind of ethical constraints and we want to regulate all this. Whereas uh, these um, uh, crazy pioneers on Mars were beyond the scope of the regulators. Um, and uh, uh, we should cheer them on uh, if they want to um, use these techniques uh, to modify their progeny to adapt to Mars. And of course, if you think still further ahead, then um, uh, of course, some people think that, um, uh, you know, we've got to more or less a limit of flesh and blood brains, and so it will be um, electronic entities that take over. If that happens, then of course uh, those entities um, won't need an atmosphere, they may prefer zero G, so they can go off into the blue yonder, and if they're near immortal then they won't be daunted by a long voyage. And so if you want to ma imagine the science fiction scenarios of uh, uh, intelligence spreading from the Earth through the galaxy, then that's the way it will happen. And these crazy guys on Mars may be the uh, facilitators of that. So we, that's why we should cheer them on. And that's the primary value in human space exploration that you see? Uh, I think so, yes, because uh, uh, for practical, um, for exploration, I mean, it's true that um, a human geologist could discover things on Mars which uh, um, the uh, uh, curiosity or perseverance robots won't be able to do, but the, the sensors and the AI is catching up, so soon they will be able to do that. And of course, um, uh, assembling big structures in space for solar energy collectors or big telescopes, that can be done by robotic fabricators. So I think the, the case for sending people is getting weaker, and it remains much more expensive uh, and, and very risky. So, so I think um, uh, human spaceflight is um, something to be regarded as an adventure, really. So in that sense, I guess you'll be cheering on uh, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos, who both seem to be competing at the moment. Right, yes. Of course, they're, what they're doing now is very limited. It's uh, not really going into orbit. And, uh, right. Um, but uh, uh, there will be people going into orbit. If, there have been lots of civilians who've been into the space station, but I know some of them, they spend very large amounts of money to spend a week in, in the space station, and uh, good luck to them. Right. And, and if, you were, if you were to go... Uh, to space or to Mars, what what uh, what three luxury items would you want to take with you? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a difficult one, isn't it? I, I think I, uh, I'd want to communicate with the Earth, and uh, it, it, it's odd because everyone everyone forgets that the um, ancient explorers, of course, um, uh, who went to the southern hemisphere, um, they never thought they'd come back and they had no way of communication. Whereas I was giving a talk to uh, uh, to uh, to school kids. Um, about going to Mars, and um, uh, one of them thought it was terrible that if they wanted to send a message, it would take half an hour to get an answer. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, people are, are so used to instant connection that uh, right. um, they really wouldn't want to be cut off. And one understands that, really, because you, you, want, you want to be in connection. Do you think the greatest risks are anthropogenic in nature? I, th I think they, they are obviously um, climate change, a lot of biodiversity, that is anthropogenic, um, but, but uh, global and, and, and slow moving. Um, as, as regards uh, others, um, of course, pandemics um, are 
at the moment, as far as we know, that they're, they're natural in a sense. But of course, um, uh, again, you're more expert than me on this, but they're, they're aggravated by um, living close to animals on farms and uh, wet markets and all that stuff. Uh, so probably the, the uh, uh, emergence is uh, more probable and of course the spread is going to be faster because of uh, air travel etc so um, uh, they're going to be more serious in future than they were up to now and I do worry very much about um, uh, the fact that small groups even individuals um, empowered by biotech or cybertech can now do something that has a global consequence and the reason it's especially worrying is just it's not clear what we can do about it because you can have regulations um, uh, about what happens in biological labs and all that and certain experiments which you may not want to do or not want to publish um, but uh, um, the trouble is that whereas building a nuclear weapon requires special purpose facilities um, which are conspicuous and uh, the International Atomic Energy Authority can monitor them um, uh, building um, a um, pathogen um, can be done in, in lots of labs, in universities and in, uh, in companies. Um, and I think unless you actually have intrusive surveillance, watching people all the time, you can't really do much to bring this probably down to zero. And I think there's a big tension between three things we value. One is freedom. Um, one is security and the other is privacy and we can't have all three of those and I think probably privacy is going to have to go um, because uh, um, even though these um, uh, threats may seem improbable they're so catastrophic potentially that one occurrence is too many and so I think this is this is my number one nightmare at the moment that in the next 10 or 20 years we may have to contend with things like that. We've discussed this quite a bit and You've made a, a, a remarkable bet, um, an unfortunate one, I guess, but um, in retrospect, but you, with, with some great accuracy, you, you predicted that, um, that there would be one million dead by 2020, and there would be a pandemic. What, 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 what made you think that that would happen, and, and to that extent, did you think it was inevitable, that, that it was just a matter of time? Yes, well, not inevitable, but I thought there was a reasonable prospect of that um, happening. Um, and uh, uh, I made this bet 15 years ago, but I was taken up on it by uh, uh, Stephen Pinker four years ago. Um, and he, as you may know, he's a very good writer, but he's very optimistic. He emphasizes how many things are indeed getting better and better, life expectancy, wealth and education, literacy, and all that. Um, but uh, he, in my opinion, is under-concerned about... Uh, um, the uh, new types of threats that are looming on the horizon, and this is one. So he 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 was an optimist, and he took me up on this. Um, now, what's actually happened, of course, is a pandemic, which is far worse than the threshold of a million, which I right. contemplated in in the um, in, in the debate. Um, and of course, it has come just at a time. It, I think 2020, that was a long way away when I went to bed. There was nothing special about, about that. It's a coincidence being so close. Um, but um, uh, we've got this. But of course, um, w what we didn't predict was that there would be this uh, controversy about whether um, it was indeed a natural pandemic or whether it could have been um, uh, a leakage or engineered in a lab. Mm. Um, and of course, um, uh, there's a serious body of opinion which thinks it could have been an unintentional leakage from the Wuhan laboratory. And um, <clears throat> the wording of our bet um, was that this uh, pandemic would be a consequence of bio-error or bio-terror. Right. And so Stephen uh, Pinker and I, we had an article a couple of weeks ago in the New Statesman uh, where we said we're not going to settle our bet yet until it's known um, uh, whether... It was indeed a, a leakage, um, but uh, um, I think we both hope that that is never understood. I mean, if, if it could be shown that it was definitely not a leakage, then of course that would, would be um, genuine, narrowing down the options and would focus it on do what we should be doing, which is to uh, make sure that uh, we monitor um, uh, the emergence of these so that any farmer 
in Vietnam or China who notices a strange disease in his crops, gets it recorded straight away. Um, so uh, we, we hope it ends up that way. But um, if it could really be shown that it had uh, emerged through carelessness in that lab, mm -hmm. uh, then knowing what American opinion is like, this would be a, a really dangerous development in international politics because uh, um, put it that, uh, um, this uh, uh, saga would have a villain. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, um, if indeed it was a leakage, then we both think it's better if we never know. Right. Because uh, uh, if, it were, if it was conventionally shown to be a leakage, and um, you know, uh, from what I've read, um, it's the minority view, but it's not, it's not, it's not crazy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then um, it, it it would be something which would do disastrous things for relations between China and the rest of the world so, if they could be actually blamed. So, do, do you think the potential? So, let's just say, if it was a lab leak, knowing that. The potential downsides of that are greater than the upsides of potentially knowing or preventing a future pandemic or a future leak. In other words, you don't think there's any real upside to, to finding out that scenario? Um, well, I think the, the thing you mentioned, the upsides, we can do already. We, we, ought, we ought to be, uh, and there are more than 50 of these category four labs around the world. Mm -hmm. And from what I've read, um, the uh, uh, security of the wall is not as good as one would hope. So I think, you know, whatever the situation here is, uh, I think COVID-19 is a wake-up call to make sure that there is really complete security um, in these uh, in these labs that are doing these gain-of-function experiments, um, and also uh, uh, an expanded effort by the WHO, um, so it is able to um, um, identify an incipient pandemic closer to its origin and therefore snuff it out more efficiently than they, they can now. So I'd have thought that whatever the outcome in this particular case, um, uh, there's an overwhelming argument that there should be more effort spent in trying to minimize um, the future um, likelihood of these things because uh, the estimates of the um, cost to the world of COVID-19 over the next five years are um, Twenty trillion dollars plus, right. and in that perspective, given it wasn't hugely unlikely, uh, then the insurance premium we should have been prepared to pay would be seven hundred billion dollars. Mm. And say, and and obviously that, that amount wasn't spent in preparation for coronavirus right. pandemics. And so I, I think uh, um, th those things should be done, but uh, they should be done, uh, and the tightening up of. Uh, lab security as well, um, irrespective of what the outcome of investigation of this uh, um, Right. And, and you're, you're not a biologist, but from the point of view of existential risk, mm -hmm. do you think gain-of-function research is, is worthwhile? You know, this is a debate that's, that, know, yeah, yeah. That, that has emerged now, whether we should be funding gain-of-function research to try to understand the nature of future viruses that might that yes. might emerge. <laughs> well, I guess the argument in favour is that if you can s stay one step ahead of the natural mutations, it might be easier to have vaccines in time, etc. I think that's the argument used. Um, but of course, the, um, when the experiments on the influenza virus were done, which is nearly ten years ago now, there was this debate about should they be done, should they be published, and the American federal government did stop for a few years funding them. I think so. Um, uh, again, um, uh, I think um, there is a case for not doing them. But on the other hand, um, even if um, they're not funded by the government um, and uh, they're frowned on, then someone somewhere is going to do them still. Mm. Um, and so uh, I think the, the frightening thing is that um, uh, there are people who will do this. Of course, you, you, uh, Stephen Pinker says, well, it's hard to imagine anyone who would, but of course, one such person is enough. And it's true that bioweapons haven't been used much in war um, because um, their um, effects are not predictable or controllable very easily. Um, and they probably wouldn't be used by a terrorist group with well-defined aims, uh, although such groups may, may use and have used uh, chemical weapons. Um, but but my, my worst nightmare would be um, some someone 
um, who was um, uh, a fanatic who thought that uh, humans were polluting the planet and that there were too many humans on, on the planet and, uh, and the planet would survive better with fewer and that they would like to get rid of a few or quite a lot but wouldn't care who. And so, so they're the kind of people who, um, um, by their um, distorted <laughs> uh, 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 values, would say, well, let's uh, save Gaia by um, getting rid of more humans. And one person like that is too many. Yeah. And of course, uh, there may be some such people because one knows um, the animal rights campaign uh, stimulated extraordinarily extreme actions by some of its protagonists. And so it's not crazy to believe that there are people who would, would do this. And as I say, it's very unlikely, and uh, I agree with Stephen Pinker who says that, but uh, as I say, one is too many. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what about the actions of, of individuals? Do you, what, what is the most impactful thing that individuals can do uh, to aid in climate change? Well, I think... Um, Obviously, avoiding waste, 25% is heating of houses, um, and uh, some of us do a lot of flying around, um, and so, so all these things could help. Um, but, but I think um, uh, these individual actions um, by themselves are never going to do enough. It's, it's, got, it's got to be a, a, a big change. And um, I do worry, because I think to replace all gas boilers is going to be, you know, barely feasible and very unpopular. So I worry very much about how that's going to happen. Um, and I think it's, it's hard, but and that's why I think it may be um, very hard for us to make the last 30% of our cuts towards zero, because that's cement and aviation and things like that. And um, I think um, uh, it, it, if we salve our conscience anyway, if we can uh, um, um, cut India or help India to, to cut um, by more than that amount, which would be a small percentage, because uh, India's got um, uh, how much more than 20 times our population. Um, so uh, um, a per capita effect, which is 30% uh, um, for us, is only 3% for them. So we've got a, f a few final quick fire questions to wrap everything up. Yeah, and we'll close out with these. Um, having started out in, in math and physics, are you happy that you've branched out into other areas beyond that? Yes, I've been very happy that uh, um, my later years have been more varied, and I think I'd have been frustrated if I'd um, uh, felt that I was um, getting less good compared to uh, younger contemporaries um, at the science I was doing in the past. So I I'm happy that I've had the opportunity to uh, do fulfilling activities, um, which are related to science and where I've used my experience but, uh, which are not straight research. What drove you and what drives you now? Well, to do, do what I can to um, spread the word about science um, and to uh, join campaigns that I believe in. Um, I'm working as hard as ever um, and um, even harder because I may not be alive for many more years now. <laughs> and uh, but certainly writing things. I mean, I finished a, another book during the lockdown and I'm working on two more now. So I think um, uh, uh, as you get older, uh, then if you have the opportunity, you feel a greater urgency. And what individuals would you say inspired you maybe previously and, and, and who inspires you now? Well, I think uh, sticking to people who um, are in science or were, were scientists, I think uh, I've known a number of very inspiring figures. Um, uh, I'm old enough to have met in their later years, some of the uh, Los Alamos scientists, the people who um, uh, founded the Pogwas movement and uh, um, returned after the end of World War II to their um, uh, academic careers, but felt they had an obligation to do what they could to control the powers they'd helped unleash at Los Alamos. And uh, I'm thinking of people like the great Hans Bethe, an uh, extraordinarily impressive scientist, um, who was a senior theorist at Alamos, and he devoted the rest of his life, or large portion of it, to uh, arms control. And um, a good Joe Rotblatt, who was the founder of the Pugwas movement, who, I, again, I got to know in his later years. And the people like that um, who um, uh, did see that they had a special responsibility, uh, since they had special expertise, 
Um, so I admired people like that, and of course, uh, um, many people in, in other fields who've uh, done the same sort of thing. But it's the physicists who, who I got to know, um, although the, the people in agricultural science and many others who've done the same sort of thing, of course. And are there any particular people now, physicists or, or otherwise? Well, I mean, I, I think I think that there are certainly some people. Would I think one of the saddest losses was uh, David Mackay here, um, who was um, someone who uh, was a, a real uh, um, uh, dedicated leader of uh, climate change and sustainability, and he died age forty nine. And I think that's one of the saddest losses among all the people I've known who've died. That he was uh, someone who contributed so much, and. Uh, had just the qualities needed to be an inspiring leader of the scientific community. What single piece of advice would you give to a young scientist of our generation? Well, going back to what I said at the beginning, to uh, uh, pick a subject which is developing fast, which suits your style of thinking, and also uh, which you think has a balance of uh, potential benefits compared to potential downsides for the world. And finally, what is the sentence you live by? Realize that life is short and cram as much constructive activity into it as you can. Very well. Martin Rees, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Yeah.